Okay, so let's continue. Um, so now I, what I want to do is to talk about the, uh, the framework called the uh, PAC framework. It's also known as the probably approximately correct framework. We're going to build this framework on top of the generalization bound we just see. And so what we want to do is to understand what kind of problem will be PAC learnable, and what do we mean by confidence, and what do we mean by accuracy. And then I want to talk about an example that try to link this PAC framework to something that we know. So to start with, let me talk about the, the, the notion of accuracy and confidence. Let's recall the equation we just saw. This is the, uh, this is the Hafting inequality applied to the in sample error and also the out sample error. So on the right hand side of this equation, you can see that there is a quantity, uh, e, uh, 2e uh, minus, uh, 2 epsilon square n. I call it as a delta. Okay. I just define it as a delta. And 1 minus delta, I define it as confidence. Okay. Uh, why do I define it in this way? So you can see that in this equation, this is the probability. And on the right hand side of this equation, there is some quantity. This some quantity, of course, it would be a number. And that number, you, it seems you want this probability to be small. That number, ideally, you also want it to be extremely small. And this delta is really defined in this way. Okay. So this delta says that the delta is e to the power minus two epsilon n. As n goes to infinity, you can see that this delta is really, really small. Okay, so you can see that this is a small number, and therefore one minus delta, and then one minus delta will be a big number that's closer to one, and this is really a good number because that would define you the, the the confidence level. What is the probability of having of not having this bad event, right? So this is a bad event, and then uh, you have uh, uh, you have two e minus and two epsilon square n, and therefore one minus delta would become the confidence. Now, uh, there is another term in this equation, which is the uh, epsilon. And this epsilon is really the, uh, the, the accuracy. Now, I call it the accuracy because you're measuring the deviation between your in-sample error and also the out-sample error. And therefore, you want your, your out-sample error to be as close as possible to your in-sample error. And therefore, you are measuring certain, certain kinds of accuracy. Okay, and you want the accuracy to be high, and so you want the accuracy to be close to one, uh, and, and therefore, and therefore you want, you, you define one minus epsilon as the accuracy. Okay, now, uh, remember that, uh, that the E in and E out, the E in is, is what? Is the empirical average, and the E out would be the probability, and therefore both numbers that are between zero and one, therefore when you take the absolute value, it's also between zero and one, and therefore one minus epsilon indeed define the accuracy. Okay, so now you can see that in this pair equation, if I tell you the delta, I can define the epsilon accordingly. Okay, how do I do that? I can just move the equations around, and then I can show that the epsilon would be defined as one, square root of one over two n log uh, two divided by uh, the delta. Uh, so uh, this equation, if you want to use the delta, then this equation would become the following: you have the probability of the bad event, which is upper bound by the delta, and this is equivalent to say that what is the probability of having a good event that is bigger than one minus delta. So now let me introduce this notion of probably approximately correct framework. So uh, the, there are two terms here. The first term is called the probably, probably correct framework. The other term is called the approximately correct framework. The probably, uh, the, the word probably used to, uh, is used to quantify the, the fact that here you're looking at the probability of having certain events, and you want this probability to be at least one minus delta. And therefore, it's called the probably correct framework. Then we have the approximately correct framework, which is used to quantify things inside this equation. Uh, here we are saying that the in-sample error has to be similar to the out-sample error. 
Okay, so you see that uh, because I want the in sample error to be similar to the out sample error, and therefore I should put the epsilon there. Um, if they are small, then these two would be approximately correct. Okay, now I'm not claiming that it is absolutely correct. I'm only saying that it is approximately correct because of the of this uh, this bar epsilon. Uh, also, I'm not saying that this is absolutely happening. I'm just saying that with high probability that this event is happening. Therefore, it's called a probably correct framework. So you, it, it goes to probably approximately correct framework. So if you can find an algorithm A such that for any epsilon and delta, there exists an N which can make the above inequality holes then we can say that the target function is uh, m probably approximately correct and it's learnable, we, or simply we call it pack learnable. So in this notation, you can see that you need a couple of things to make a, a target function to be pack learnable. First of all, you need to fulfill this inequality. Okay, this inequality says that you want to make sure that the in sample error compared to the out sample error, they are close together. In addition, you want this to be probability, in terms of probability, there is a high confidence of happening. Now, what do you also need? You need to show me that you can actually find an algorithm A. And for this A, with this A, then for any epsilon, for any delta, you will be able to find an N such that when N is big enough, okay, then you can say that the target function is pack learnable. So you need to redefine really an algorithm A, and you need to show me that for any n that is big enough, then the above inequality will hold. Okay. So where does the n go into this equation here? Well, the n will go into the equation through the through the uh, in sample error because the in sample error is the average, is the is the empirical average, and we know that as n goes to infinity, the in sample error has to go to very close to the out sample error. And therefore, uh, we're expecting, for when n is big enough, this should hold. Now you may also ask, where does the algorithm A go into the, to this equation? The algorithm A is actually used to help you determine the function a, the h. Okay? Because of a specific, specific algorithm you use, that you will end up having a different hypothesis function. If you use a support vector machine, you may choose a separate hyperplane in this way. But if you use a perceptron algorithm, you may have another hypothesis function. Therefore, by having a different A, you will have a different H. And by using a different N, you will have a different E in. And therefore, you want to make sure that for, for whatever epsilon and for whatever delta you give me, I will be able to find an A, an N, such that this inequality holds. If I can find such an algorithm, then we say that the target function is pack learnable. Okay, so I'm going to talk about one example that is taken from uh, the following book. And you can look at it in that book and then look at example 2.4. If you want to look at the derivation, I also have the appendix uh, in this set of slides. So the, so the problem is as, as follows. I have a set of data points that are marked by the orange dots and the blue dots. Okay, so they are all living on a 2D plane. And then I tell you that there is a target function R, and this target function R is a rectangle. The rectangle is inside uh, the, the, the orange dots and is covering all the blue dots. Okay, so this is the target function. This target function says that all the blue dots if you ever draw any training sample, you're ever drawing any blue dots, it has to come from inside the, the rectangle. If you ever draw a training sample that, that is marked as uh, uh, the other case, the other label, it should be drawn outside the, the rectangle R. So no matter how you draw the samples, since this R is the target function, and I assume that inside will be 1, outside will be 0, or vice versa. Okay, so all the samples have to be drawn in this way. So, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the drawing. So inside would be blue, outside would be orange. And I assume that the data, they're intrinsically separable because of the construction of this problem where everything inside is blue, outside is orange, there's no overlap. Okay? So that is intrinsically separable. Uh, this is not linearly separable, but it's separable. What is our goal? Well, the, our goal would be to pick a hypothesis rectangle, 
are prime using all the available data points. Now we ask, is this problem a uh, pack learnable? Okay, so in other words, will we be able to find a rectangle R prime by just looking at a finite set of blue dots and a finite set of orange dots? If we are able to find such algorithm, uh, uh, then we ask, as the number of training samples goes up, as you have more blue points and then you have more orange points, will we be able to approach to the, to the R, to the target R, arbitrarily close? If we're able to show that, then we say that this target function R is pack learnable. So what should we do? Well, this question is very general. This question says, it's about the nature of the problem. It's not about, uh, it's not about the specific algorithm. It's about the nature of the problem. Uh, you can find one algorithm to show that it is pack learnable, but that can also, if you can find one, that probably means that you can find other algorithms. Okay. Uh, so we want to show that this problem is indeed pack learnable. We want to, uh, uh, uh show this result. And, uh, and in, uh, so what do we want? Well, mathematically, we want to show that there exists an algorithm A, okay, which can take this data set, training and then the training data points, the red, and the, the orange, and also the blues, and then return you a R prime, such that for any epsilon bigger than zero and delta bigger than zero, there exists an N, which of course it has to be a function of epsilon and delta, with this probability uh, being true, okay? And the probability would be the in-sample error compared to the out-sample error evaluated at your hypothesis I, uh, out prime. Uh, if this is, this bad event is uh, upper bound by delta, then uh, you show that then this problem is uh, pack learnable. Okay, so if we can find such algorithm, then the problem is pack learnable. Okay, so in order to show this uh, proof, what we want to do is, of course, we want to uh, develop an algorithm and show that if this algorithm works, uh, then, then we will be able to claim uh, 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 the proof, okay? So let me propose an algorithm and try to show that this algorithm is indeed uh, able to achieve the bound that I'm describing. Uh, the algorithm would be this. Give me a set of data points and then I, w I am going to find you the tightest rectangle that covers all the blue circles. So what does it mean? Well, you have this uh, orange set of data points, you have a set of blue data points, and then let's imagine that the blue data points, they are really uh, sitting as what I'm showing you here, okay? So now what you're going to do is that you're going to define an R prime, which is a rectangle, and this rectangle, according to my definition, it has to be the tightest rectangle that covers all the blue dots. So what can I do in this example? Well, you look at this example here, you have all the blue dots, and then I'm drawing you really the tightest rectangle, right, like this. Uh, this rectangle is the tightest because all the blue dots, they're inside, and I leave no additional space for the, the blue, for, for the blue dots. Okay. So now for any set of, for any finite set of data points, I should be able to come up with an R prime. That is the tightest rectangle. And that would be my, my algorithm. The algorithm is very simple. You give me so many data points, I am going to find you that rectangle. Now how do we do it on computer? That, 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 that's not a discussion here because you can always write some kind of program to achieve this goal. But imagine that you do have that algorithm, you do have the program, then this procedure of finding the tightest rectangle is indeed defining an algorithm because it's taking the data points and it's returning you a hypothesis. And by learning algorithm, we mean something very general. Give me the data points and I return you the hypothesis. And this A is indeed achieving the score. So now I have the tightest rectangle here. Then we ask, uh, what will, will we be able to show the probability inequality? In other words, as the number of training points grows, as N becomes bigger and bigger, will we be able to show that uh, the, 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 the gap between your R prime and R is becoming smaller and smaller. 
So what is the intuition here? Well, the intuition here says that as n grows, we can find an R prime that is getting closer and closer to the R prime. Well, why this is true? Well, you can look at this example here. Uh, as the number of points grows, okay, uh, then you can see that the, uh, the, the blue dots, they're occupying more space in this diagram. However, uh, you, sh you will still be able to draw a rectangle that covers all these blue dots. This is possible because by the problem definition, the orange and the blues, they are separable. Therefore, there always exists a rectangle that can bound all the, all the blues. Okay, so what is the consequence? Well, the consequence is the following. As the number of samples grows, you can see from this diagram, what is the error? Well, the error will actually be the gap between your orange R and also the blue R prime. Okay, so you can see that there is a ring uh, over here, and this ring, uh, we define the error. That is what we call the, uh, the, 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 the uh, testing error. Okay, now why do we call it the testing error? Because anything that's inside will be, will be the training error, and then what, anything that is in the ring, that will be the testing error. Because, uh, because outside the, the dot, the R, R prime, that will be the case where you will not be able to declare there is, uh, that, that will be blue. You will, anything that's outside the dot line, you will say that that is actually the orange. Okay, and therefore that will that will quantify the the, uh, the the testing error. Now, what would be the training error? The training error in this case is always zero. The training error is always zero because you, 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 by construction you're putting a box, you're putting a rectangle that covers all the training points inside your R prime, and therefore by definition uh, your training error is indeed zero. There's no, it's not possible to have a blue dot that is outside your dotted line because the way we we define your error from A. Okay. And therefore, the conclusion here is that for any epsilon bigger than zero and for any delta bigger than zero, uh, it is possible that as long as n is large enough, we will be able to make the training error and testing error as close to each other as possible. And here training error is zero, and therefore by making the training and also testing error close, I mean that the training, the testing error will be going to zero, uh, as n goes to infinity. Okay, so now if you're interested in the proof, uh, I, I would encourage you to take a look at the appendix. The appendix will outline the proof. The proof is not too complicated. The proof says that what I want to do is that I'm going to uh, define my, my, my testing error into four segments. And then as, as I change, as I move around my, my R prime, I will be able to show that using the Hafting inequality, uh, and to, to get to this epsilon and delta and then define the ends. All right. So to summarize, what we have shown um, today is the following. We, we we call that not all problems, they are uh, learnable. And for those problems that are learnable, uh, we require the training and also the testing samples to be correlated. And to achieve this goal, we also need to use a, a tool called the Hafting inequality. And this inequality says that the out-sample error and also the in-sample error, they have to be bounded. Uh, and so for accuracy, for any accuracy and any delta, uh, epsilon and any confidence delta, if you can find an error from A such that as long as N is large enough, then you can claim that the problem is pack learnable. So what we are going to do next time is to look at the hypothesis set. Okay, and we want to look at the problem that is not discussed in the Hafting inequality here. Here you're only assuming that it's only one hypothesis function. But in general, when you try to learn an algorithm, you actually have a set of hypotheses to choose from. So in that case, how should we change the Hafting inequality in order to capture that kind of phenomenon? So we will discuss that uh, in the next lecture. Here's the reading list. I will encourage everyone to take a look at these uh, materials. And thank you.